Uh, first up on our general business is verification of the meeting being properly posted. Uh, yes, it was. Excellent, thank you. Next up is the opportunity for public comment. We're now at the section of our meeting where there's an opportunity for citizens to speak. Each individual will be limited to three minutes time <coughs> to speak in order for us to hear from the community and then get on to the agenda of our meeting. We will signal the speaker at two and a half minutes in order to allow a wrap up of their comments. We expect all speakers to honor our time limit, refrain from using any inappropriate language in any manner, and be respectful in their comments. Speakers who do not meet these expectations may be prohibited from speaking at future board or committee meetings. We also expect that the audience will be respectful of the speaker and of the board and refrain from responding with verbal comments, cheering, applause, or other behavior that would detract from the meeting. Please note that no obstructions can be created between the board and the audience and that the area behind the speaker and podium will be clear during public comment. Also, in order to respect our speakers and meeting participants, please silence your cell phones. All right. First speaker this evening is Samuel D'Amico. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank the uh, FNF committee for allowing me uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, tonight, I'd like to speak once again in opposition to the superintendent's signage removal policy. Uh, of course, I do understand that this might not be the most appropriate uh, setting to do so, but I am taking advantage of every and any res resource I have to voice my grievance against our administration. Uh, the superintendent and deputy superintendent are ignoring students, teachers, and community members that come to this, uh, that come to speak to this governing body uh, and voice their opinion uh, to their policy. What appears to be obvious is that we won't just go away after being ignored. On the contrary, we're to keep getting louder. Uh, there are students coming to this very podium almost in tears telling you what your policy is doing to them, to their friends, to their schools, and to our district. And has the policy been changed since then? No. The policy has only expanded. Uh, every time a staff member or administrator at a school asks if this or that is okay or included in the policy, the policy keeps expanding to include what is not okay. Uh, it's almost as if the policy is being made up as we go. Uh, it's not very clear what the policy entails or why it entails what it does. It, it's very inconsistent, and yet we're left with it as the set precedent. What I hope comes from me and other students speaking so passionately about issues like these is administration actually hearing our voices and listening to what we're saying and taking action to support their students, something that isn't happening right now. The lack of justification and excess of entitlement on the administration's part is the exact manner in which our district is getting tired of. While children are going to school every day uh, with the personal life experiences of the stories that have been told at this very podium, our superintendent and deputy superintendent haven't been able to justify their policy in intent or their policy in practice. While the Board of Education or administration, when the Board of Education or administration enact a policy or proposal, they are obligated to justify themselves and their policy until no more questions are to be had. In this instance, there are many, many questions still to be answered. Where's the scientific data to express this policy is going to make education more curriculum-based focused? Where were the questions to students and parents before this policy was enacted? Why is the rainbow color scheme perpetuating these unimaginable consequences that students, not rainbows, are facing the brunt of? Copied and pasted emails aside, why is administration actively lying and ignoring students, staff, and families? Why has there been no self-evaluation from administration to fix the policy themselves after hearing the student's voice? Administration is usually quick in getting involved in board businesses or the lives of students and teachers or what have you, but where is administration now? They are hiding in the dark because we caught them, and now they're standing like a deer in the headlights. I'm once again asking the superintendent to rescind his signage removal policy immediately and put the best interests of his students in his decisions in the future. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Mr. Paul Reese. Good evening. I wasn't ready. Um, a while back, Karen asked to bring, um, I believe it was to the FNF to um, the free lunch program, to, to bring that here back for discussion. And I don't, it's not on the agenda. I don't know if it's coming back here or when. Um, so, but I, since I love coming to FNF, I thought I'd come here tonight and speak about it. Um, so, Greg, you asked some questions about, um, like, you got to explain how I'm going to feed all the kids if we're not going to do this. Um, 
it is so easy for liberals to just like to virtual signal and wear a little pin on their chest. I care, care more than you. I care more. I'm going to give someone else's belongings to this or another generation's income to this generation because I care so damn much. And it is, it actually is just, it's infuriating to me. The, the notion that, that you hand out a sandwich and you put this pin on and it's not a guarantee that anyone gets it, first off. It's not a guarantee that this goes to a kid. The problem is a lot of it is drug and alcohol use at this level and that after bar parties come home and that, those, that food that is intended to, uh, for the kids gets eaten by other people and that kid is left with nothing but you got your pin, you did something, right? And um, then there's, there's the fact that a lot of people who also struggle with income work during the day and have to go to work and they can't get there to, to get something that would help them out. There was, this is a nothing new. In the past, the Romans had something called bread and wine where they gave people this. And what it did was it expanded the gap between the poor and the, and the upper class because the upper class used it to get more ahead and the poor just had enough and they stayed poor. Which brings me to my other point is, why do we need this? We have a public education that's supposed to be so great. Why is this needed? Why are people so poor that they can't feed their children if you're doing your job? I, I would like to know how that can be possible. Why are so many people needing lunch after getting a public education from, from Waukesha or anywhere else? It is, it's astonishing how many people need food after being educated in our public school system for how much money. And yet you leave every day and you think you've done a good job. You leave and you hang a pin on yourself, look at me, I care. But if that kid ends up dead under a bridge somewhere in two years from now with a needle stuck in your, his arm because he can't get ahead, who cares? What problem is that of ours? We, we've done our job, we wear our pin, we've helped our, we've done all we can. The education, the, the, we, the notion that these so many kids need help or adults can't make it in the real world. I work in a machine shop and the lack of understanding of basic things is just, I, I, it frustrates myself when I have to teach them how to read a tape measure. How to, how to make, what's the difference between a negative and a positive number? Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Our next speak, speaker is Dave Richmond. Um, the reason I was going to speak tonight uh, was a couple of things. First of all would be the um, discussion at the last board meeting that this would be that the conversation would be had again about the free lunch program. I see that as not on the agenda, which I see as a positive and a negative. Eventually, as a school board and as a um, community, we are going to need to have calm conversations about it. There are some great points, both positive and negative, and it has led me to have a lot of conversations with people that differ from mine and differ from everyone else, well not from everyone else, but every, that differs. We've had some great conversations, point being, and talking about the pluses and minuses of, of what the school board um, first attempted to do without any backup and then was forced um, to kind of reconsider. And I am most appreciative of the school board to take the time and listen to some very upset people and do what was right for the community. On the flip side, <clears throat> the community does need to look at all options. We are a richer than most school district. We do need to look at some of those other options. But we need to put plans in place and not just talk amongst ourselves without any facts. I also have a number of issues, and I know this is not the place, but I believe this needs to get heard in front of the school board is um, in terms of recent decision on signs. Um, <clears throat> and I cannot find any data supporting <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, distracted here for a moment, uh, appears to be a sack, lack of communication in regards to the sign policy. There will be a lot of speakers again on this on Wednesday. I encourage you all to come in with questions for the administration on why it was done, what research was put into this, 
and what kind of lack of response is being done to the community and where are some of these individuals getting their facts from because sign policy that has been passed outside the curriculum is piss <coughs> excuse me is poor it's just a poor decision I can't dress it up any more than that I could put some other adjectives and adverbs attached to it but I won't but to put the signed policy in place thank you with no conversation no community feedback and then all we get in response are standard answers in a copy and paste format I spoke at the last committee meeting and I brought up the fact I have two graduates son and daughter who are part of this community part of the school district and are no longer in this district they're going to college and how disappointed and sad they were with the events of what's going on Hi. thank you pretty Markwell How do, you, how do you pronounce your last name, sir? Moore. Moore, okay. My name is Michael Moore. Um, I live in Waukesha in the community, 1711 Elder Street. Um, I have, I'm a school teacher, and I have two nieces in the school district of Waukesha. Um, I'm just coming to speak on behalf of some concerns that I have in this district. Um, we are from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we made the decision to come out to Waukesha for a um, better quality of life, and we knew that the education was um, that we were going to give our my niece and nephews were going to be um, much better, so we thought. Um, there's been some concerns. Well, in the beginning, we were very happy with what we saw. You know, the education quality that they were receiving. Now, now um, there's some concerns that we have um, of things that they are learning in school that um, really is dumbing our kids down. Um, we can talk about Common Core. We can talk about all those other things that. Um, are really not best for kids I mean, I'm a school teacher myself and I'm just not happy with what some of the things that I'm seeing in the district of what my nieces and nephews are learning um, I just hope that we can get back to a place where um, Waukesha can become that community and be that epitome of uh, the example of why families flock here um, again for better quality of life better quality of schools great teachers and a great school system thank you Anybody else that wishes to address the committee? Pretty seeing none, moving on to our action items. First action item up is approval of minutes from the September 13th, 2021 meeting. Looking for a motion. There is modified minutes on your desk. Are there any questions? Question discussion regarding the minutes. None. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. For it's four zero. Uh, our second action item is approval of the vouchers. We have three voucher <clears throat> pardon me, three voucher questions this month. First was on voucher three four three two nine eight for advanced planning technology for six thousand four hundred and twelve dollars. And the question was, what was this for? And it's our annual fee for um, our service agreement with facility for facility manager maps. And um, that's a tool that we use for mapping of the buildings. Is everyone familiar with that tool? Otherwise, I'm going to ask Darren to speak more on it. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone's familiar with yeah. that. Okay. Um, Mr. Como. We have too many. No problem. The second um, question was on voucher 343308 for Colectivo Coffee for $855.50. And the question was, is this for a fundraiser? And uh, <laughs> it's actually for the girls cross country team. And the question really was, is this for a fundraiser to make the girls go faster? <laughs> so I thought that was kind of humorous. Um, but yes, it was indeed for a fundraiser. It's the girls cross country team and they sold one pound bags of Collectivo coffee to earn money for the team. So did the school district buy $855 worth of coffee or what was the fee for? 
Um, I believe that they sold the coffee and then they paid and picked up the coffee and okay. delivered it, is I gotcha. what I understand. It gotcha. Was. And the girls made money on the coffee. They made sale. a per yes, percentage of the thing. Okay. Excellent. Uh, okay, the next voucher was 343717 for Newslia for $10,800. And um, this is a service, it's an annual subscription service. This particular invoice was for Les Paul. Um, but it's a service that offers level and standards aligned informational content that is available in English and Spanish. And it's the content is designed to engage students, facilitate differentiated instruction, and align to the state's education standards. Um, I read where they will take an article and they'll uh, rewrite it in five different grade levels and publish it out. There's free content available for people, but then there's um, curriculum-based uh, content also available that's aligned with your school district. And that's what this is for. Now, last year we had a district-wide subscription and um, the sites paid for specific additional content. And I believe our, we'll see next, or November, um, yeah, that is next month, the district-wide subscription probably coming through too. Excellent, thanks Sherry. Is there any other questions related to the vouchers? Anybody? All right, I'd be looking for a motion for approval of the vouchers as presented. Thank you, Mr. Como. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is the approval of the stormwater maintenance agreement. Yeah, this item was on last month's um, agenda as well, and there was some follow-up questions that the committee asked me to get responses on. And um, an attachment to this um, document is an email exchange I had with um, our attorneys at Bulow Vetter. Um, the first question um, you know, essentially was, is this kind of a new thing? Yeah, um, it's the first one I've ever dealt with, but also is there anything that stands out? And, their response was that it seems pretty standard, but then they went on and listed those bullets of things that we should just be aware of. <clears throat> I think the the most unique language one in there is the third bullet where it says owners is solely responsible for maintenance and responsibility once the permit is terminated. And they said that language is in there because normally you have a developer and then you have someone who buys the property. Right. We're the developer and the person who owns the property. So that's what that language um, really doesn't apply to us. Um, as, as clearly as it should be. And again, the rest of them are just, um, I guess, points to know. We have a, a, a obligation to maintain um, the stormwater plan um, as developed and some other things that go along with that. But then at the bottom, the question was asked, well, what's our um, responsibility if it's not designed appropriately? And I, I think they speak to that um, Pretty good terms, especially the, um, the first paragraph at the bottom of the page related to this topic, um, that we have some protection as a governmental body, but more importantly, we hired contractors to design it per the specs, and the city did approve them. Uh, that would be our primary um, line of defense if something should uh, arise in the future. And again, this is for the Butler campus, uh, where we did a lot of um, parking lot work out there. A lot of asphalt was, new asphalt was put on there, so um, it, it drew the need to have this type of arrangement uh, with the stormwater. So uh, if there's any other questions, I can certainly try to respond um, or provide the answers. Mr. Coleman. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Darren, I appreciate you reaching out to our legal counsel on this. Um, it seems as though, um, you know, reading their analysis here and their opinion that looks like we're, you know, this is pr pretty much the same that they would have for virtually any new development that's happening where we need to have water retention. And, um, you know, I, I feel comfortable with, with the analysis. Um, basically, we're responsible and um, I would assume that that's, that's the case no matter who, who would own the property. And I can see some of the, where the city wanted to tighten some things up um, 
where if things aren't being done properly, that they do have the right to come and knock on our door. And um, I just think these are the times that we live in. We have to spell out every little thing uh, for every little circumstance and make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Um, unfortunately, that's the time that we live in. But um, I'm, feeling, um, I'm feeling comfortable with, um, with the agreement. Did we, um, who did we have designed this stormwater? It was a company that specializes in that. It wasn't the city or anything. No, no, was. no. Okay. We had a firm. I can't. No, that's fine. I could send that out in the Friday update or email tomorrow as well. I can't think of the name of the firm off the top of my head. It looks like according to the lawyers <clears throat> with the whole immunity, governmental immunity statute, any recourse with the problem that we had would be to the people that designed it, right? right. That's what I'm reading. Um, and then they talk about permit termination. That's, what does that mean? That's that the developer by the owner. Oh, oh, so when it goes from the developer to the HOA. It terminates with the developer. Developer, and then the subdivision takes yeah. over. Gotcha. So, so it, there's, no it term, there's no termination then? No. Okay. No, it's just... No, it's just a continuation. We try of, to use blanket language for yeah, different situations. No, sure. Okay, I was just wondering if this is a limited agreement. So speaking to that, does this is this agreement in perpetuity or is it? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yep. Unless something on the site changes and we have to redo something, right? Unless right. there's a redesign, I yes. would assume. Okay. Whether they amend that or create a new one, I I don't know the right. answer to that. Alrighty. Any other questions relating to our stormwater agreement with the city? Okay, looking for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Ranchak. A second. Thank you, Mr. Dietz. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Four zero. Thank you. Uh, our final action item on the agenda is the approval of remaining referendum projects. The, uh, all the major projects, meaning the safety and security projects that we did and the improvements at the middle school level are substantially complete. We're, we're, we have some punch list items that we're going through. We have some supply chain uh, issues with some equipment, not much, but, but with some and some furniture. But um, we are very close to um, wrapping up the referendum of, of a few years ago. So as it stands now, and we've taken into account the punch list items that may be out there um, and, and a few other things that we are looking um, at as options as we as we close out at these schools, and we believe as of today, um, and we have it's a pretty good number, a, a balance of three hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred three dollars remaining. So um, again, all the all the work at the sites are done. So um, we're we're trying to identify well what can we done, do to close out um, the referendum work um, that on, honors the question because you have to follow the referendum question, and I, and I included that. Um, referendum summary that has the question at the top and, and it speaks to um, work on the site and at various locations so I think this certainly falls but we're looking to use uh, $263,000 of this for the duct cleaning and uh, coil cleaning of our HVAC systems uh, this has gone through an RFP process so this is a bid um, bid number um, we're looking for that to be the next phase. And then by that time, we're getting down to you know, less than $70,000 probably left. Um, and we'd like to do something along the lines of parking lot maintenance, something that we could respond to quickly, maybe get a lot of that work done this fall. One thing with the duct cleaning, we talked about that in terms of the ESSER um, funding. And we haven't, we've just started the planning for ESSER um, just a few weeks ago is the prevailing wage issue and this would take away that and save us about um, 15 percent um, on that work so on the salary portion right. of that work so we think it fits in well it's timely work that we're looking to get um, going this this duct cleaning and coil cleaning um, and air balancing will allow us to start the um, migration of our buildings to MERV 13 filtration on the equipment we have that um, is comparable and works with um, MERV 13 because there is obviously more air restriction with a MERV 13 filter. Um, so I've listed all the schools that it would be 
would impact. And pretty much as all of our schools, except for the three middle schools, um, their systems were all upgraded with the referendum work that's been done the last couple of years. So there's really no need, um, truly no need to, to move ahead um, at those locations. So the duct work and uh, coil cleaning and the balancing, that work would start um, later this month. We'd be done on second shift, so it wouldn't uh, encumber the instructional day. And then we would expect by spring that all of all of the uh, cleaning would be done and, and the conversion to MERV 13 um, uh, filtration where we can would be um, completed as well. We would, we would upgrade as we're going. Um, this work's all contracted out. Um, so we would stage it to follow. Now, one question I was asked, um, we will probably lead with the elementary schools because I was thinking the, there's no vaccine for the elementary level, um, that we would start there and then close out with the high school level um, as we move forward. So that's our plan um, that we'd like to proceed with and, and get your okay. But we thought, even though it complies with the question, um, we thought we should come back and actually get approval. Excellent. Any questions? Mr. Dietz. Uh, Mr. Clark, could you tell me what kind of cycle the district is on as far as the duct and coil cleaning within buildings? Is it on a set schedule or is it? No, I don't think there's ever been a set schedule. Okay. Um, my guess would be when work, when other maintenance work allowed for it, it may have been done, but there's not to my knowledge. I can, well, for six years, there hasn't been a set schedule. So some buildings might not have had this work done for five or six years? Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, at least. Okay. Any other questions? If there are no other questions. We're looking for a motion for the approval of the remaining referendum projects. So moved. Mr. Deese, is there a second? I'll second that. Mr. Como, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None, four zero. That concludes our action items section of the agenda this evening. Next up is discussion information items, and the first among those is annual school health and nursing report. Take it Thank away, you. Mr. Cook. Yeah, so um, annually uh, we report to the board uh, through what used to be the safety committee and now the uh, finance committee, um, just the overall work uh, from our nurses uh, and our health room staff over the course of the year. So uh, included in your board packet was the eight page report uh, about the activities of the nurses and uh, who we have and what they do. Uh, last year, just to summarize, was a very busy year uh, with COVID in our schools. Um, they stayed very busy, you know, helping us with our planning, with our monitoring, uh, with the implementation of our mitigation plan. Um, they also handled the training around uh, diabetic care, tube feeding, um, and our uh, students who have more significant health needs, allergies, and such. Um, they are excellent uh, at what they do. Uh, they provide ongoing professional development across our sites to make sure that our kids are cared for while in school. So I'm here to answer any questions you have uh, on the report, um, if you have any. Any questions on the nursing report? Mr. Como. Um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, Joe, uh, first of all, I appreciate this is a relatively abbreviated report compared to some of the ones we've had in the past where um, actually I appreciate the abbreviation. Um, I'd rather have it be more succinct. Um, it's always been fact-based, fact uh, and there's a lot of facts in, in this. Um, the complexities of what our health rooms uh, specialists have to deal with seems to continue to become more complex over the years. Um, I remember 19 years ago when I saw the first report, there were some things that we didn't even take care of back then that we take care of now. Can you, can you talk to any potential trends over the last couple of years that you've seen um, that, that have changed? Yeah, I mean, we have seen, uh, we saw um, about... 
uh, eight years ago, uh, we started to see an increase in students who had uh, diabetic care needs. Uh, that's leveled off over the last several years to approximately 50 students in the district uh, who are receiving daily cares in the school. Uh, at the elementary level, that starts out very hands-on. As we get to the high school level, students begin to self-manage. Obviously, they're getting older and they can handle that. Um, we have uh, experienced uh, for... Uh, uh, probably the last five or six years, uh, a steady increase in the number of students with allergies uh, in our schools that we have to monitor and make sure we have a plan in place for, uh, including being able to administer emergency epinephrine if needed. Um, and then uh, the number of students with asthma has stayed consistent over time. Um, students uh, are able to carry a rescue inhaler with them while they're in school, uh, but from time to time we do see a more significant asthma attack in schools that our health room and our nurses have to respond to. We have also, uh, uh, our, the number of students, and you can see it, I think it's on the third page of the report, uh, the number of students with the gastrointestinal disorders has increased, um, you know, to the point now where we have th 13 students who get uh, G-tube feedings during the school day. And the associated um, uh, uh, training that's, you know, with that and making sure that we have staff uh, who know what they're doing. Um, we're very hands-on with our training early on in the year so that we know our kids are taken care of throughout the course of the year. And some of the, some of the items take a fair amount of time. Right. Um, you know, it's not like, okay, um, excuse the student for a, a quick rundown to the health room and you'll be back in a minute. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the procedures like diabetes that take some time and sure uh, you know our diabetic checks can take you know anywhere from five minute quick check just depending on the age and the need uh to more you know 15 minutes or so um those are scheduled you know primarily it's a very he lunch heavy time of the day uh when kids are getting monitored just generally in mass of uh, the lunch period making sure that everybody is you know at the right levels going in to lunch and then after lunch so that we can maintain stable blood sugar while at school um the g-tube feedings and things like that those take you know, more significant time. Generally, that's paired with a, a special education paraprofessional who's who's providing that assistance. Uh, those cares can take uh, you know anywhere from a half hour to an hour, just depending on the student need. And those are ongoing day to day things. So uh, the training that the nurses do with our health room staff, but also with our special education paraprofessionals, uh, you know, it's 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 essential. It's ongoing. Um, they are you know when the school day starts, they don't have a lot of what we would consider to be office hours. They're going from school to school, location to location, classroom to classroom, making sure the kids are taken care of. Can you speak to the training um, of the paraprofessionals? And Depends on the student, individual student need. So it's it's generally hands-on for uh, students like our health room staff and our nursing staff. Um, you know, there's a training that we follow, training modules that we follow through Children's Hospital. Um, our nurses uh, go through that training. Uh, they provide training on site. Um, you know, you could be looking at for per individual staff member four hours of training a year, uh, plus on site uh, observation by our nurses uh, to make sure that they're doing the cares appropriately. Um, some staff get 15 to 20 hours of training. It just depends on the students that they're working with because some of those cares are obviously um, more uh, invasive, higher level type type care. So it's customized training so depending the upon yep. the workload. And yep. then um, it. we also, I would imagine, have changes throughout the year. So, you, you know, uh, the nurses are going to have to adapt to that and the paraprofessionals will have to adapt to that. Um, is do we see a, a lot of change throughout the year, or is it, we kind of get the snapshot of who the students are? And yeah, I mean, our students. Um, I to categorize it as a lot of change. We do see change over the year. Um, our students, you know, you hit those ages where um, you know middle school puberty is setting in, the body's changing, uh, so we have to make adjustments. You know, throughout the year, we get students who are newly diagnosed in the middle of the year. Uh, we need to then make, provide additional development of our staff in those locations. Um, we do have staff turnover in our health room and staff turnover among our paraprofessionals. So that does require a level of ongoing uh, training as well. <laughs> so, you know, we don't necessarily check the box at the end of uh, August saying our staff is trained and we're ready to go. It is something that's monitored and ongoing all year. 
Okay. I, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing that with us. And can you um, speak? I, I know a number of these, um, at the very bottom, we talk about some of our partnerships, and some of these have been around for a, a long time. And can you maybe uh, speak to some of the things that our, our partners do with us? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Ostendorf, uh, she is the one who will write the script for our epinephrine and write the script for our Narcan across the district. And she also acts as an in-time on, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, yeah, in-time uh, consultation for our nurses if questions come in. Um, Waukesha County Technical College, we do have a lot of staff that are trained in AEDs and CPR and first aid. Uh, we partner with them on that. Um, the public health department uh, has been, you know, there for us in the past. We've dealt with uh, 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 head lice and chicken pox and, and that in the past. Um, with the last, I'd say, 18 months to two years with COVID, um, you know, they've been essential uh, partners for us uh, as, as we've gone through kids who have been identified uh, positive and just, you know, being, keeping us to, up to speed on the general guidance that's out there around COVID. Um, the Lions Club is a great partner, charitable organization. Organization. They help us with the vision screenings for students, um, which you know is essential uh, in, in, in many of our locations. But we do have some students that otherwise would not be seen in our district. Uh, Louise Wilson is worth mentioning, particularly this past year. Again, with COVID, um, she's worked uh, statewide with the Superintendents Association. She's presented to school boards, and she's also been a, a resource for our nurses as we've come up with processes and procedures in the district. Uh, Children's Hospital. I mean, they are a premier. Uh, organization for us to work with. Um, they provide guidance, uh, you know, to to many levels in the organization. But specifically, our nurses work with them on student health plans, and they're extremely responsive. Um, and then the prevent blindness. Um, the, again, they support the vision screenings uh, in our district. So. Um, you know, we we're very fortunate uh, in this community to have the community partners that we have and the resources that we can go to um, to make sure that our kids can access what they need. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Welcome. Related to the nursing report, Mr. Dietz. Uh, Dr. Cook, could you uh, talk to us a little bit about the communication that exists between a uh, health room person and the district nurse? Let's say that something happens in the building that requires a nurse's attention. Obviously, there's probably a good chance the nurse wouldn't be in that school that particular day. That's <laughs> usually how things happen. But how do they communicate? How does that? Yeah, so the uh, health room staff all have access to the nurse's cell phones. Um, so the, the nurse will be on consult. Uh, if there's ever a big enough, you know, a big enough situation uh, that requires, you know, an immediate nurse, they get in the car and they head right over there. They, they also know that they're never in the right place at the right time. I mean, that's kind of the, you know, Murphy's Law, I guess, on it. Um, but between the cell phone uh, uh, consultation and then the immediate response, we are fortunate. We do have three nurses in our district. They're phenomenal at what they do. Uh, very well trained and they do an excellent job of communicating. So they're they're responsive. Um, you know, just because we have nurses doesn't prevent us from calling 911 if we need to. Uh, so we can reach out for emergency assistance if it's needed. Um, but, you know, our health room staff is extremely highly trained as well. Um, you know, they, they know what they're doing in the event of an emergency. Um, they're trained CPR first aid, AED, epinephrine, uh, Narcan, uh, and the works. And we do also have backup staff in the schools. Uh, the building secretary administrators are trained in a number of those things. So if an emergency arises, uh, you know, we can certainly reach out to 911. Uh, we are fortunate that we have uh, the SROs at the middle and the high school level. Um, and uh, and our nurses, you know, are, are there, you know, as, as soon as practical uh, in all situations, but also on the phone with people if an emergency is, in, 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 is needed. And does this district have um, like an emergency um response team within the building? Yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. Which would consist of? Uh, trained staff hour by hour that are available plus administration. That would include uh, training on AED? AED, epinephrine, um, AED, epinephrine, CPR first aid, and Narcan. And we have AED units in every building? Yeah, uh, two at the secondary level, uh, one in each of the sports areas at the secondary level, uh, and then one at the, I'm sorry, two at, one at, two at Butler, two at Les Paul, um, and then one at each of the elementary schools. So, yep. We also have Narcan uh, located in each of the um, AED locations. And then just one final question. Could you just give us a brief overview of um, Medicaid billing and what that entails and why that's important for the district? 
Yeah. Um, so uh, Medicaid billing, uh, our nurses assist with that, as do special ed paraprofessionals, uh, speech and language pathologists, OTs, occupational therapists, physical therapists, uh, special education teachers. Our bus company uh, supports that. And uh, what it is is a series of services that are Medicaid eligible, uh, so such as speech and language service, uh, uh, counseling services, um, attendant care services, which would be the personal cares, uh, the toileting and things, uh, plus uh, safety concerns in the school. So if you have a student who has elopement issues, you know, a staff member could bill for that. Uh, transportation is also a billable cost. So what you need to have is two billable costs, and then the associated staff record that. And we have partnered with Compass Care now for a couple of years uh, to manage that Medicaid billing for us. So we go into the Compass Care system, we record the services, the amount of time, we make sure that that's supported in a student's IEP. Um, what that does for us in the end is it gets us reimbursement uh, through the Medicaid system to our general funds, um, you know, brings dollars back into the district um, for, you know, for the business office to apply to our budget. Do you have any idea about what that number is? Sure. Didn't we get a check last year for $800,000 or something like that? Average. There's three different components to the money that we get. We get the monthly claims reimbursement, and um, I don't have that figure off the top of my head, and that all goes into Fund 27. But then there's reconciliations at the end of every year, and those come retroactively. And last year we had close to a million dollars in the two components. One is administration and one is services. And between the two checks, it was close to a million dollars. And um, that goes into the general fund because it can um, – impact our um, MOE and special education if it gets put back into the current year, it can um, hurt that calculation. Mm -hmm. Struggle with the budgets, the timing of the payments. It's never know. Yeah, you never know. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Cool. I remember a dozen years or so ago, we weren't collecting on this. Yeah, we, we collected, there was a period of time where we collected very little. Um, uh, we began to ask the question particularly around uh, our transportation because we do transport a lot of students and how, how could we begin to capture that attendant care uh, transportation billing for those kids. Uh, Jason Gahan, our secondary director of special ed, uh, worked with Compass Care in one of his prior districts. So we had a meeting with them and, um, you know, it worked out to be a very good partnership for us. And, and so that we start to see that now in those settlements and then also those monthly reimbursements. Yeah, I, I think the effort is definitely worth it. And I mean, there's significant dollars and, um, and we should be receiving those dollars. I was going to say, I can tell you that last year in the claims where I said I didn't have the figure, we received $416,000 in the claims, the monthly claims for this also, in addition to the million that I spoke of. Alrighty. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Moving on. Our next discussion information item is the Employee Health Clinic. Come on in, guys. All right, so uh, about, I don't know, 10 months ago or a year ago, we started the conversation about looking at a better um, health, and, uh, health uh, employee clinic for our staffs, and we went through a process, and, and ProHealth was awarded um, the contract effective January 1 of 2022. Um, and we, we made a lot of those decisions and we've been working on it all summer. Um, so I'll bring up a slide deck and then just wanted to give you an update on, on where we are in the process and what locations we've um, selected and kind of recap services that will be offered. Um, so we have uh, Pete Bacon from ProHealth and uh, Vicki Dolman papke who's really been leading, no offense, Pete, but oh, really, really leading the charge. Um, she's excellent to work with. And then Jean from HNI, who I know you've seen um, for all of our health insurance conversations. Um, her, her, uh, her team at uh, HNI has been helping us for years, even pre-HNI days. So 
So I'll, I'll turn it over to um, ProHealth and, and we'll walk you through. I'll, I'll click the slides okay. for you if you want to give me a signal. Um, going to kick us off real is, quick. Is this working? I just want to make sure. Is there a light? Yes, it is working. It is working? It is working? Okay. 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 All right. Well, All thanks. Right. Well, thanks again for uh, inviting us and, and having the trust in us to, to help you with your employees and such. And we're really looking forward to it. Um, we've got a, a lot of people have been working on this so far. The school district's been absolutely fantastic to work with, and I think we got a great, uh, great uh, solution here. And we're really looking forward to getting this off the ground. And and uh, once again, thank you for you know your confidence and the opportunity to serve to serve the population. So with that, I want to turn it over to the person that is doing all the work. That's Vicky. And uh, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to jump on in at any time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I will go to the next slide, Darren. Um, so our first slide here is really, um, really to reiterate um, the functions or the outcomes that you all were looking for when you sent out the RFP which was to increase your patient access or your employees' access to health care as well as their dependents, lower costs, look for high efficiency and quality organizations to partner with, and effective use of technology. And um, we demonstrated that um, through the RFP process and interviews and stakeholders had here with you over last winter and the spring. I'll go to the next slide. So we wanted to kind of dive a little deeper into some of the details because we're in what we call phase one of our process with you and that's uh, kicking off our health risk appraisal and influenza um, process um, actually Friday. Um, so we've been working with the district all spring and all summer including uh, your broker. So the, the district has chosen two locations and I'm going to show you a photo in a minute so hang on to your uh, PowerPoint here. Um, so our near site clinics will open in January. You've chosen two locations, our Brookfield location and our Waukesha Memorial location, which you can kind of throw a rock from here um, at our Waukesha Memorial location. Total of 40 hours a week. Um, so it, it's going to be 40 hours total. You could use 30 on one campus and 10 are on the other. Um, we are going to be really super flexible with that. Some of the options include in-person care and virtual, and we're very um, happy to um, be able to provide virtual um, care and care um, as your um, employees have just gone through what our my chart experience is in, in signing up for the HRA and their inf influenza vaccine. Um, some of the services in January will include primary care and prevention, and those visits are like physicals, a medical issue, or chronic care like hypertension management, etc. Um, we also offer urgent care, uh, sprains, strains, cold, flu, COVID, um, et cetera. We will have simple x-rays at both locations that include limbs and, and the chest, so uh, maybe a sprain, strain, possibly a fracture, maybe bronchitis where we have to take an image of, of the chest. We'll have some basic lab tests um, that are uh, included in the agreement. We, we can order any lab tests on your employees, but part of the agreement are, are those nine lab tests that are frequently used um, in most primary care and preventive care. We're also offering navigation services. Many folks are, are truly not connected to a PCP. We'll help them connect to a PCP. We are a, a, a department that will help with care and care delivery, but um, we're not there official PCP, so we will we'll help um, all of the folks that don't have a PCP to get connected. And the one thing that I'm very passionate about and our organization is passionate about is clinical quality and population health management. And that includes prevention and chronic care. So items like mammography and colonoscopy orders, um, making sure um, folks are on track with their diabetes management, making sure they have their lab tests done, et cetera. And really, um, uh, challenging ourselves to be the best, um, to hold those HEDIS measures at five stars um, for your members and your dependents on the health plan. The next step is also to um, take on the employees, um, and that's through the new employee evaluation, so hiring of new employees, and you do that frequently, but most often a bolus in the fall. Um, drug screening, work injury, so if someone has a work injury or uh, illness at work, they, they will come to see our our providers at those two locations or location that they, they desire. And then phase one is happening right now. And we've been working really super hard. 
um, health risk appraisals, health coaching, influenza programming, and well-being. As of this morning, 1,200 people are signed up for the HRA that starts on Friday. Uh, Kay, uh, who's your representative um, that works with us through the HR, is very pleased with that sign up. Um, so uh, I, I um, should add, I forgot to mention, Kay is calling in from my office, so I apologize, Kay, but she has uh, led the charge on um, not only HRA, but the, the switch with the, the clinic altogether. So. Yeah. So um, we're very pleased with that. Um, um, it'll be a busy Saturday um, um, here um, at the school district. Over 200 um, folks will be doing their health risk appraisal and flu shots. We'll move on to the next slide. Uh, these are a, a photo of the clinics. So you'll see Waukesha Memorial. We're in the professional office building, uh, Suite 310, beautiful uh, location, and our brand new location at, Brook, uh, at Brookfield on Discovery Drive around the second floor. That just kind of gives you an idea what things look like. Next slide is our um, patient experience. Um, it's really our promise, our patient promise around access, the visit, and what happens after the visit. How to schedule an appointment, phone or through my chart, and now your team knows how to use my chart. So, bonus, um, how to do this. Um, so very easy to do. Get your retrieve your records, etc. Ask a question. And then the visit obviously can be face-to-face, walk-in, or virtual. Uh, we'll have virtual options for everyone. Um, they can see the primary um, advanced practice nurse or if they have an urgent issue. Our urgent, um, our urgent virtual care is open 8 to 8, Monday through Friday, and 8 to 4 on Saturday and Sunday. So a lot of coverage there if they don't want to come in and see the provider. They can address all issues. We can document in there. Um, they will receive information either through my chart or paper copy, depending upon what they desire. And we wanted to focus a, a few minutes on medication management. We know that the previous vendor did have medications on site. And when we looked at those, we believe we can offer really cost-effective medication management through the clinics and our virtual uh, urgent care options. Our after visit summary, very proud of, and this um, is really surveying um, the employee or dependent or spouse that comes in to see us. They're going to be um, texted uh, several questions, you know, how was the service, anything we could do better. That immediately comes back to us, and if there's an issue, we can correct that. We also can, at the time of the visit, if they need to see a, a physician um, outside of our, our um services we can help arrange that whether that's a specialist or primary care um, reinforcement of the use of my chart which we did through the hra sign up and then we're also going to be alerting uh, anyone who's in our record um, that they're due or overdue for testing whether that's prevention or chronic care um, through my chart so we're we're trying to really push people onto that technological which you all wanted to see um, and get them using that um, as efficiently as possible We'll go to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit briefly about implementation. I know our implementation for the HRA is October and November, but we started many, many, many months ago. And like I said, um, over 1,200 people are signed up. And probably about 600 of those folks signed up for MyChart. It was their first experience with MyChart. Um, so um, it, it went really smooth. Um, we're going to be on site for about a month. And then in November, um, the team that includes Pro Healthcare, your broker HNI, and, and K and team um, meet regularly, and we will be um, starting to kick off our second phase in November, which is the promotion of the clinic. Um, that opens in January um, for in person and virtual visits, employee health, occupational health, and we have appointed a manager full time who started already and has been on our team since this summer. Go to the next slide. Communication um, is super key. We wanted to make sure that we had really good communication, um, that we took Kay's lead and we were able to get everything she needed through our marketing and corporate communications department who professionally um, put together our communication plan. Um, so we're in full swing right now through the MyChart sign up that, and, and campaigns that will drive programming. Like I said before, if someone's due or overdue for something, um, we want to see you. You haven't been seen. We'll be reaching out. Um, registration for on-site um, through that 
they received a personal invite. So um, those that are um, part of the staff, you know how that worked. You signed up for your HRA, you got, got an invitation, and then you selected your dates and times that you wanted to have your services, and you completed your questionnaire on site, and, and then we see you in clinic. And then at the event, or there after, you can schedule your coaching once you finish the HRA and flu shot on your results of your tests from the HRA. Later in, in November, we'll be promoting the clinic um, with a launch in January, and that's going to really focus on types of visits, our location and hours, how to access us, and possibly meeting the providers, um, So, and an open house um, for folks. So more to come on that. Um, it's, it's kind of high level, but there's a lot of detail, as Kay and the team and myself know, um, in all of these um, statements that we've said today. So questions for us about how it's been going through our phase one and now moving into phase two. Thank you, Patrick. Um, can you remind me on how we chose the two locations? Sure. Um, this was your team, um, um, and we looked at actually um, where people live and lived and worked, and there was probably three options, and they chose two out of the three. Okay, and we always have the ability to to look at more locations uh, over time. Are there any restrictions on that? Um, I know annually we're going to look at that, um, but let's say if mid year. We think there's a demand, let's say, out in the McQuanago area. Sure. Or, Absolutely. You know, we couldn't. We can change in the middle of the year, also. Yep. We just need a little bit of time to make sure we can properly get the staff mm -hmm. in there, but uh, that's no problem whatsoever. Yep. And and we committed to quarterly meetings um, with the group. I, I think we'll be meeting with Kay more often. You know, as we get rolling, um, so we and um, develop a cadence that she likes. Um, but I think quarterly, um, a report um, that would include all the um, items that you all had asked for, you know, how many visits, what type of visits, who's coming, um, what patient is the experience, patient all experience. All those things will be in there, so mm -hmm. be a, a report, and, and, you know, we want to be measured against that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, could you also remind me of the cost savings that we... From switching from <laughs> mm -hmm. the old clinic to the new clinic. Yeah, that was a big part of our discussion. So you're spending about 1.1, a little over 1.1 million now on the, what you have. And we looked at ProHealth being about 575,000 of cost. So there's still about a half a million of savings. You know, and, and we started out with just the two sites. If you want to do more hours, you know, we want to make sure it was at, right. at a right level mm -hmm. um, to make sure we're not, you know, not using uh, resources appropriately. And as that grows, you could add some, but um, I think it's pretty safe to say you're gonna have some very nice savings and you have the virtual component, which you did not have uh, did not have before. And you didn't have the my chart, which is a, is a big deal yeah. going forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I've used my chart. I do use my chart. Um, it is phenomenal as far as I, I'm concerned. Um, it, it's a tool that really can help you manage your, your healthcare. And so I hope you, you said 600 of the 1,200 were trained in it already? Yeah, 600 were naive to it, yes. Yeah. That was the first time they had ever touched my chart. Right. Right. So the others right. probably already had a my chart, many win. of them already had a my chart. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's I th great. Yeah. I think that, and, and the, the hours that were chosen, um, could you also speak to yeah, we're still how, working how that on was the determined? Hours, um, but the, we have um, standard hours, and with the virtual health, we're available 8 to 8, Monday through Friday, all day Saturday and Sunday. Clinic hours are 8 to 4.30 um, But it'll be primarily. certain hours, and what we want to do is we'll, we'll um, monitor how the population is, is accessing services. Mm -hmm. So if we have to beef up more in the morning, we can beef up more in the morning. If it's dead during the middle part of the day, we don't want to be having people sit there. So, mm -hmm. so we'll we'll adjust quickly over time. But um, you know, we're working with the staff to make sure that they that you know what works best for the staff. Mm -hmm. Well, and just I, I really appreciate how flexible you've been so far, and I hope the flexibility continues. There's no reason why I wouldn't believe that you. And I, I mean, I I really think that that could be key to this being successful in terms of increasing the number of people who attend the clinic, which 
um, you know, hopefully they get their troubles um, diagnosed sooner and made in more of a preventative mode. And a number of years ago, we went to a, to being self-insured. And so this is part of a, a larger strategy of, um, you know, that whole self-insurance uh, process that we've we've undertaken. An appropriate strategy. And yeah. The one thing I, I really want to emphasize is the technology piece. So we work very closely with United Healthcare. We have all your employees that will be listed. We'll know, like Vicky, Vicky said before, who has or has not come in for diabetes checks or labs or, or whatever. And by having this technology, we can push the message out to them saying, hey, come on in. And, and, and now with some of the online scheduling we have, click here to, to, to you know, to, to sign up. So we're really trying to make it efficient for them to access care. Um, a lot of this can be done at the clinic. If there's some things that have to be done outside the clinic. The other thing that we committed to is, um, you know, some of the consultants that, uh, that run around saying, oh, the fox overlooking the hen house, that's their favorite thing. But what we committed to you is, is anytime we refer somebody out to a, a different provider, um, those will all be level one uh, uh, tier quality and cost for United Healthcare. So you know that those are the most cost efficient, most um, quality effective um, uh, care delivers. And, and we have every specialty covered, but you know, if it doesn't work, we'll, we will send it outside our system. There, we have no problem whatsoever. Will that be part of the report that we receive quarterly, or is that more of an annual kind of might be able portion to do it of the report? Quarterly. Yeah, we might be able to. And do that quarterly. might be too frequent. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, it was more of a curiosity yeah, question. Yeah, sure. so, so annual actually, might be appropriate, but we have a, we have a nice tight group that will be managing your population. They will be well versed, and here is what you do. So um, they can always go elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, the individual can. But we can show you from a referral standpoint. We refer it to these types of providers. These are tier one providers. We can make that all happen. So. Mm -hmm. Tier one, regardless of health network. That's correct. correct. Not, right. not, not just correct. Right. Right. That's so, right. So everyone's clear on that. And I, I, I just think that that when I first heard you say that, I'm like, really? And so what that tells me is you're concerned about the patient relationship with the doctor and that they receive the health care that, that they need and want, and want right? Our, our board's very clear to and, us. They want us taking care of folks in our community. And, and, um, and having that s score, that process uh, uh, available, that was the first time I had heard on, you know, that, that whole process. Sure. So sure. The other thing that we did is we changed our referral process a number of years ago. So all the specialists, depending on the type of referral that happens, if it's urgent, they have X number of hours to get back to the patient. If it's not urgent, maybe it's three days or four days. This is all built into their metrics too. So um, that's really tied down a lot of things. We're in a really good spot there. And I, the patients have really appreciated that, that they're not having to go out and call specialists. We, we get that tied right into the process. Yeah, thank you. When that reporting does come back, just keep in mind that 75% of our claims are already with ProHealth. So if we come back and 75% of the referrals are ProHealth, that's yeah. might be just a continuation of what's been going on. Any other questions? Mr. Dietz. Is this the first uh, type of endeavor you've um, committed to as far as uh, another school district, or is this common throughout the area? Well, over the many years that I've been with ProHealthcare, we've worked with other school districts um, and manufacturing as well to do something very similar to yeah. this. So we do we do on-site nurses. This is a first near site. Well, we did it with Genera, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, but it all works the same the same way. Um, it's everyone's linked into Epic. All the providers in Southeast Wisconsin are Epic. So mm -hmm. this is going to work uh, quite nicely. So we're we're very excited about this. Mm -hmm. And any surprises so far, or things that came up that? No surprises that we haven't been able okay. to handle. <laughs> so we've got we've got some programming in Epic that that's we're <laughs> that's that's in process, and that will all be done here shortly. So I'm very excited about that. The the system's uh, very interested in making sure that this is a is a is a great relationship for all. Thank you for all your hard work on both ends. Guys, hard work. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Over at K. She's That's right, a lot K. of hours yeah, in on this. There we go. But it's interesting. They've, they've all developed a very good relationship. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, one of the things that we committed to you is that we're not going to waste your staff time on a lot of things. You, know, you hired us as professionals. We're going to do it. There's some things that we want to get feedback. 
from the district, but we want to present you with the with the answers and the solutions and and make sure we're aligned. That that's what our goal is. And and you know the, the staff, you you know, you, you folks aren't you don't have all this extra staff just sitting around looking for nothing to do. And and so you know this, these are things that we do every day, and uh, we want to make your lives your lives easier. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, reporting. I was thinking maybe um, a report through June 30th, the end of our fiscal year, meaning it might not get to F and F until August or September. In 90 days. Um, okay. Just to give you an idea of where where we're going, because I don't know if we'll have anything. If you're if we're having numbers just off the charts right away, I'll, I'll certainly be sending that out in a Friday update. But um, in terms of a formal report to this committee, I would guess late summer or early fall. Any other questions, comments? Excellent. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank I appreciate you. it. All right. Have a great night, everybody. You too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up under the discussion information items is district fundraising. Yeah, I have the, uh, if you guys want to come up and share the mic, um, the athletic directors from the three high schools and Dr. Siebert and I have been talking, and the, the principals as well, um, about fundraising and how that fits into a, a long-range plan. And, um, and we started talking about some things, some projects relatively small, some could be very large. And, um, and we decided it would be best to um, come and just share our ideas we don't have a specific plan to share tonight we don't have a powerpoint no slide deck or anything um, but just to get the committee's general um, <clears throat> response um, to the theory then we'd come back with, with a more formal presentation of um, our next steps but uh, i didn't one of the things that we shared with the ad's was we didn't want them out asking for things when the board didn't know that the question was being asked it'd be different if it was a few hundred dollars here and there or whatever um, but um, you know, when you're talking tens of thousand dollars or anything like that, uh, I thought it just best to come and, and kind of get a okay. That sounds all right. We'll be you know we're interested in hearing more. Um, so I'll turn it over to Kyle or whoever wants to lead off and, and you can outline what we're thinking in a little more detail. Well, good evening. Thank you for your time. And uh, Kyle Lemieux representing West High School. Uh, Dan Schreier, Waukesha South High School. Branch Line North High School. And so we, as the athletic directors, are here essentially representing our leadership teams at the high school level. And uh, we come before you because we believe that right now is an appropriate time to start this process and conversation of what it would look like to have a strategic long-term plan around facility improvement with the school district of Waukesha. And so as athletic directors, we have the unique privilege of traveling all around the area. We get to see inside and out of every other school system and district uh, near and far. And so if uh, you know, you're anything like an athletic director, you're constantly thinking, oh, I like that, I like that, I would do that a little differently. Well, what about, you know, and how could that look uh, best in Waukesha? And so um, likewise, we know that our students, our parents, our community members, they're taking those same trips. They're having that same thought process as they go through. And so um, our hope in visiting the committee tonight would be first to, to share our passion for this. Um, I think if we could jump across the table, we would. That this, this is exciting work. This is the positive, really good stuff that we want to dig into. Um, and then secondly, to uh, openly request permission, as Darren had said, to investigate this further. And what would this really look like to be done well with the School District of Waukesha? I think as we've started to peel back a few layers, uh, we have found that we will need to ask and find answers to many challenging questions. We will need to seek some insight and resources from other communities that have done a great job of this previously. Uh, I think we'll need to take a close look at the current policies that we have in place when it comes to acquiring funds and make sure that they are in alignment with what we would hope to do. And then ultimately, our goal would be that as a, a committee of sorts, we could bring a proposal back to you uh, with all that information in hand to uh, essentially put out um, for everyone to give feedback on how this might look best to start down this path as a school district. Uh, we fully acknowledge the complexity of this work after sitting around the table a few times with uh, groups of us. This, this in some ways can become very big in a hurry 
And so our goal, our task would be uh, to put it into a comprehensive plan that, that works for all. Um, and I think we have found in Waukesha over our, our history of projects that we are stronger together. Being able to do things with a unified approach is great. That being said, we also have the understanding that we have three unique schools that have potentially different goals and different priorities in place at this time. So striking that balance is something that we've already had plenty of conversations about. But before, like Darren said, before we begin to uh, run around asking for the moon, um, we want to be sure that we are open, transparent, and certainly gathering your feedback as we uh, would hopefully be able to begin this work. Any questions? Can you give me an example of what other districts have been doing? Uh, maybe a couple that you would like to emulate and look at, look out and say, or seek out some more information to better bring things together for your proposal? Sure. I, I think there's a few different um, avenues of sorts. So when you ask that question, one thought that comes to mind is what we get to see within our Class K conference and some of the upgrades that maybe a Muskego has made recently and how when you walk into their facilities, there's a, there's a bit of a wow factor. You look at McWanago and what they've pulled off recently, whether it's their auditorium or their stadiums or their fields, um, there's, there's a feeling that when our kids right now, when they go to those places, they remember when they went there. Like, that was a special place. Like, wouldn't that be neat to have something like that in Waukesha? Um, there's other communities like Hartford right up the road that have launched into uh, similar types of campaigns. And so we're hoping to kind of take some of their great ideas when it comes to how they're attempting to partner with their community. You know, what does it look like to have mutually beneficial um, positioning where, you know, we're all in this together? And um, so I, I think there's some examples there. I think when you look at some of the other larger districts across the state, the Kenoshas, the Racines, um, and even up in the Fox Valley, those districts have also had some recent success in upgrades that we'd like to dig into further. And when you're talking about fundraising, are you talking about uh, community involvement as well, as far as um, people are sponsoring sponsorships or, you know, where does it, where does it end, I guess, or does it? I, I think that's one of our million dollar questions, right? Um, being able to look at what is palatable right now when it comes to uh, you know, the, those private or individual donors within our community? What would it look like to partner with businesses, both at a local and regional level? Um, and what does it look like to have an investment uh, on behalf of the School District of Waukesha, right? And I think as we found, um, just like that, we're approaching almost a decade that it's been since our Field of Many Dreams project. And I think one of the wins that came out of that was the learning of determining that if we tried to rely on just a single component of fundraising, uh, it did not go very far. But as we look at, I always kind of envision like building the pie of fundraising, right? Everybody has their appropriate slice. If the slices aren't balanced, um, usually things are, are stuck in the mud. And so what we were able to do through that project was find an appropriate balance with those slices of the pie between what SDW was able to contribute, what uh, advertising and, and partnerships were able to contribute, and then what private donors could to help us cross the finish line. So that's obviously on, on one scale, you know, as we look at the, the totality of projects that we would hope and dream of, um, I think it will take many different forms. But yeah, so when I say fundraising, maybe it's a better to say the acquiring of funds. I think it can take many forms. Just after listening to you for a few minutes, I've, I just have no doubt that the vision is already there, which is pretty exciting to me. And, um, you know, you're just exploring all options and everything's on the table and just that's where you're starting. So I applaud all of you for your efforts and look forward to hearing from you as uh, time goes along. Check. Thank you. Well, we're kind of starting at a negative because South's uh, or our um, turf fields still weren't paid for. So we're kind of at a negative balance already because that didn't fully come through yet so maybe we can start with what we still owe or is that wiped clean now Darren do you know <clears throat> that was wiped clean this last fiscal year so we just absorbed that right 
How can we not do that again? Well, that's one of the things that we've talked about, and certainly the ADs bring a vision, and I, I'm hoping to bring structure. And if someone commits to making payments five years down the road, it is hard to mm -hmm. fulfill that commitment. Um, but I think um, we learned a lot from Field of Many Dreams, good and bad. I think, um, and I think there's some safeguards that you can put in place to better ensure that things like that don't happen. Is there a guarantee that those things type, you know, a, a business could go out of business and they're halfway through, those things happen. Um, but I think we can pos position ourselves to uh, minimize that. And mainly I want, I just want to, what I'd like to see is just a system that the board knows what we're doing and is on pace for that because it's easy to question it afterwards. You know, I, I think that's, you know, we all question the field of dreams and the, the areas that we may have failed in a little bit, but... Um, won't make those some of those mistakes again that's for sure not to overlook all the wonderful donations we did get and as mm -hmm. far as so just don't want to i guess gloss over that and pretend it didn't happen because it did so i just want to put some safety measures in place as yeah. you said and and we've we've met two or three times now on this we've talked about that very very thing some of the shortcomings of that arrangement that we had um but again, most of the people who committed money did pay. Um, for those people who may be listening at home. Richard Como. Yeah, can you put that in perspective? So, what was our total amount for the fields? And what was it? Was a pretty small percentage that we weren't able to collect. And to be fair, um, there's things that just happen sometimes. So, for example. The paint didn't stick to the field that we thought we we're going to be able to have stick to the field. And some of our private donators, that was important to. And so stuff sometimes happens. But from a dollar's perspective, remind me roughly what that percentage breakdown was of what we, what couldn't, we didn't collect. Yeah. I believe the project. 1.6, yeah. Darren, you're not. Yeah. Um, the project, uh, the the three football fields, um, the project total was about 1.6 million dollars. I want to say the district put in 300,000, 500,000. The rest was all fundraising. Um, the advertising, we ended up not collecting around 70 thousand dollars of that, and then the um, end of the arrangement with SC Waukesha added a 250 thousand dollars of dollars we did not collect. Um, so we collected about 70% of what we thought yeah. over so, a multi-year period. I think that's one of the things we can talk about is do you go all five years again? I don't know. Um, try not to do that because time's not your friend right. when you're collecting normally or for donations to be made. Well, I'm glad that we're looking back at the field of dreams and what can we take from that? Um, Cause there were, as you said, there's both positive and negatives and I, Two, two of the three of you were intimately involved with that. And um, there was a lot that happened. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into that. Um, and and a, a, a lot of moving parts. Uh, a, a board that needs to agree to uh, a project. Um, donors. Um, how, how, what should those fields look like? Should, be, should they be the gold standard? In the state of Wisconsin, or something in the middle, or just something barely getting us turf in that case, you know. So, you know, I um, first of all, I appreciate um, you approaching us and um, shedding some light on this because, as we all know, as board members, as soon as anything starts to happen, we get calls <laughs> on, on whatever it is, good, bad, and the ugly. So, so thank you for that. Um, I, I do look forward to uh, having a better understanding of, of what you might have in, in mind. And I, I don't see why we shouldn't be at least looking at this. And we partner with our community for all sorts of things. And um, I, I think uh, as you guys witness and you have a, your pulse on what this looks like throughout our state, um, there's there's more to it than a wow factor. There's functionality. There's a certain minimal uh, amount of safety. 
Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just a, a wow factor. So I appreciate you guys coming before us tonight and seeing, seeing if we can get something going. I appreciate that. I, I would add with the, the turf project, uh, one of the interesting parts of that project at that time was uh, part of the difficulty of the conversation was that it was seen as a want rather than a need. And it was seen as even potentially excessive, right? Well, here we are seven, eight years later, and it, it is the standard, it is the norm, and I am so thankful that we transformed our facilities the way that we did. Um, because, you know, I think in all these types of projects, you're going to look at what the potential cost is. And I think the way that I've chosen to reframe it is what the investment is because those dollars that were spent have turned into hours upon hours of field use and activity from a curriculum standpoint, activities with our band, um, you know, our school as a whole, the events we're able to have. Before we had that, it felt like it was Fort Knox on our grass fields. And yep. you only stepped on them at certain times. Yes, and so very restricted. Short, short had of to be. adding a new gym um, or something to that effect. So Brian really wants a new gym. Um, <laughs> but uh, for, Not to interrupt, <laughs> for the record, Brian has one less gym, one bas one less basketball court than everyone else. Thank Just you, Darren. This isn't all our committee notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> it's on the record now, thank you. <laughs> but uh, it, it, at the time, was an interesting conversation because of how it was viewed. Well, now we have the, uh, the ability to fast forward to present day and see that it was a really wise investment. And so part of our job, part of our goal, is to forecast when these wants will become needs and make sure that we aren't feeling left behind um, and making sure that our community understands when and why we're making these movements when it comes to these improvements. Mrs. Ranchek. One last comment. I remember I was on the board for a few years and um, no one but Paul would come to the meetings and um, <coughs> you could hear a pin drop in here most of the time and that this boardroom was packed out the hall. Every coach got every every player and their parent, and I think probably their grandparents and aunts and uncles were here. Um, and people really were engaged to want that. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a popular um, a popular thing to do, and you guys are going to really see the involvement. But, um, yeah, I I just remember so many people being here and really really wanting that turf field so as you said many years later many more years will have to come so thank you mr deets i just want to thank uh the athletic directors for <coughs> even uh going going here um you know i know that uh, your job com is very complex and you have a lot going on just a lot of evening activities that uh, add up to several hours a week um, and at the same time um you're able to fit this in and, and think about uh, the bigger picture and think about the students and staff that, uh, and the community that can utilize, um, you know, some new things like this and different possibilities that are out there. So, um, and at the same time, you also have um, a role as an assistant principal. So very complex, very high, de high demand, a lot of hours, um, but you're still coming to this board, uh, looking out for uh, the best interest of our students and staff and also um, looking to the future. So I want to thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you very much. I know there's a lot of hard work. Um, the only comment I would have is we had it with the, the field of many dreams or is equity. We don't want one school getting a ton of stuff and the other ones that can't don't have the, the funding to get it. So I know that's always tough to work out. Um, but I know you guys will, but and you, you missed one school. That's fundraising. I hear Kettle Moran might be fundraising for some stuff. So uh, you might want to look at them, see what it, because it's not going to be bake sales and tennis tournaments for the stuff that we need done in the district. So it'll be a lot of work. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alrighty. Our next discussion information item on the agenda is the monthly budget report. Okay. Um, Get away. Thank you. 
For September, in our local sources, are they continue to be the largest amount of student fees and textbook fees. Um, the September payments dropped a little from last year, but overall we're still um, showing a, can, um, a significant surpass of last year's uh, collections. So that's a good thing. We had, um, in, for state sources, we received our first equalization aid payment in September, totaling $7.8 million. And just in other revenues, received a U.S. bank rebate of $50,288. Um, that's been a very good program for us. That's from our P-Card program. So overall, we've received 6.33% of our budgeted revenues compared to 5.66 this time last year. Um, no surprises, nothing out of line in what we've been receiving yet. From an expense perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, salaries and benefits, the percentage is running a little bit high, but I don't think it's an issue. I'm running salary projections right now with our September payroll done just to um, ensure that that's true. But last year, our budget was a little high. So the budget was high. The percentages were lower based on a high budget, and we really worked to make sure the budget was pulled in and and uh, more accurate this year for salaries and benefits. So I think that that percentage is in line with where we expect to be. It just looks different from last year. And and while the percentage difference is small, when you're looking at the millions of dollars that we have in salaries and benefits, it's you know a significant amount of money. But I'm currently working on our salary projections based off of our September payroll to make sure that we are in line. And we'll have that done prior to the final budget presentation in case we need any tweaking before the final final budget. So Sherry, what what um, would adjust those projections? Pardon? What would change those projections? If and the um, but for the salary and benefits. Sorry, I'm really not understanding what well, why you, would you they said be you're different you're or? running the projections, so what what um, oh. quite, you know what would happen to change those projections? So one of the things I've noticed is that our aids seem high um, okay. in perspective and when we were developing the budget, there was a discussion about how many aid positions were going okay. to change. So that may not have changed as much as right. we thought it would. So that might be higher. Gotcha. So there's different factors. And when we're budgeting into what comes to reality at the time right. we start school, that um, sometimes need to be relooked at. But I, I really think it's going to be OK just looking at my initial projections. I think the difference really is the fact that our budget was high last year. We came in under budget a bit on salaries last year. Okay. And like I said, we honed in the budget this year to try to be um, tighter on right. our budget and okay. not have that extra. And so that means our percentages are going to look a little okay. higher because the budget's a little bit lower. Also keep in mind, when we, when we build the preliminary budget, we're going off of June data. Right. A lot yep. of hiring hasn't been done, so that can tweak it as okay. well. But there's always some adjustments um, towards the end. You get the hotspot elementary grade that has that odd number where you either have 28 in the class or you yep. add a or third. So it's things like that. Then, then just finding out who's actually here. Right. Um, how, does our, um, are. how does our subfill rate play into those projections? Well, we we have a sub budget that we put out there, but last year it was significantly under budget because okay. of being able to fill. I noticed on our dashboard that our sub fill right now is in the green, Low. whatever bad color it's, yeah, it's, it's in, in right color. now. So if we can't fill subs, then the sub budget is higher than what okay. we spend. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. The sub budget isn't an area that I'm concerned about going over budget on right okay. now. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But this year, I wouldn't look at our expenditures. Right. We look at 75% as a sub rate, but we've been below that yes. quite a bit this yes. year. I mean, as low as 25%, I think, on some days. So, And like, and like last year, the, the teacher aid line, there was so much turnover, just constant turnover. It was hard right. to, for us to really project out very well. Um, I don't know if it's a, to that extent this year. Doesn't I don't think it's that, but um, just you know, last couple of years have just been right as we've said a thousand it. times, so kind of unique. So, are we concerned about the the CPI that's going to be coming out here pretty quick? 
that number is going to be considerably um, higher? Well, as part of our workshops, I, at some point I was going to mention that because it is going to be substantially higher than um, yes. we've seen. And for people who are wondering, CPI is the key calculator multiplier that goes into um, what we're allowed to offer the teachers uh, union. So, yeah, that is a – okay. I don't know if concern is the right word, but it's certainly a point of conversation yeah. where before, the last few years it's been so low. Right. I think the lowest it was one tenth of a yeah, percent. It was. Um, yep. So it really didn't get talked about that year. But yeah, it's a, it's a good the point. The projections are pretty high. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nearly double, probably, what we're averaging. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it looks like that. Thank you. So our next I'm sorry, Mr. Como. But oh, that will impact next year, not right. this year. Yeah, right. Year. right. 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 Yeah. Just so people know right. that out in TV yeah. land. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, this year's rates are established. Um, purchase services, we had some large expenditures, so I detailed them out. Um, none of them are anything we weren't expecting. They were planned for purchases, some stock or flooring work, cut a hay roofing, Playworks, which is an annual subscription that we have. And I apologize, um, I have this spelled wrong. It's Qualtrics, I believe. Qualtrics, yes. not Qualtics. Um, and that's the software we use for surveys and things. And um, we had legal fees and audit service uh, payments that we had to make, and then a lot of smaller items, but it added up to a significant amount in our purchase services, but again, nothing that we weren't expecting to be spending, and nothing that wasn't budgeted for. Um, main technology expenditures were for our annual wills a subscription of $193,000 and CISA 12 for a Wise Dash membership fee, which is $35,000. The, all the tuition payments that were in this month were for the for Montessori School, which is the majority of it, and then our 4K partners we pay quarterly. Montessori we pay twice a year. Um, Non-capital objects, mainly general supplies, um, we also had a, a larger textbook spend, but like still under $100,000. So for the textbooks, again, everything budgeted for, nothing unexpected. Capital projects, there was a credit, and it was for technology-related hardware for some, basically it's transfers from other the sites where IT purchased some things up front, and then the sites buy them back from IT. So IT buys a big supply of things to save money, and then when the sites need them, and that's why there's showing a credit this month in the, the technology. No debt retirement in from the general fund in September. We did pay in out of fund 39 our interest payments. Um, our, we have in uh, September of every year we have to pay interest on our debt, and that was taken care of on the last day of September. So, but that doesn't appear in here because that's paid out of fund 39, not 10. Insurance adjustments. We had our quarterly insurance payment. It was booked you know, last year. Was booked in September. This year, booked in October, which is why it looks like there's a much larger insurance payment. It's just the timing of the payment. No transfers. Um, other objects. Really minimal spending. But right now, overall, with our Fund 10 budget, we're at 11.33 percent of the approved budget, and we are at 10.85. But it's really a matter of the timing of when we're paying things and some projects that. Um, we're paid, so it's all good. Nothing bad that we're worried about right now. Revenue for Fund 27, uh, minimal. Medicaid payment was the only special education payment we received in um, September. Again, that's normal. Uh, we really don't start seeing the special education funding money coming till November. Expenses, salaries, and benefits, again, same thing as Fund 10, but it's the same situation. Our budget was a little bit um, high last year, or... Um, uh, a little, I don't want to use the word inflated, but it was higher than what our expenses came through. We honed that back down, so I would expect the percentage to be higher, but we will um, uh, make sure our projections are coming out in line with our budget. One thing on those salaries, <coughs> excuse me, from last year, we also had budgeted some fund balance for COVID response that we ended up not utilizing. I think that was right. probably the biggest variance between the two years. Okay. This dawned on me. That's a good point. Here. Thank you. Um, really, the, for purchase services, our main spending was a payment for our, toward our CISA contract, our annual CISA contract, supplies, uh, just general supplies in the non-capital objects, no capital purchases, nothing else really in Fund 27. 
Um, they're always low this time of year, Fund 27 expenditures. They start to pick up as time goes on, so nothing out of line. Fund 43, again, interest is our only revenue. Um, we have no more funding coming for Fund 43. Our expenditures are, um, again, just the contractor payments. We're starting to really dwindle that down. And um, as Darren had shared earlier, coming to the end of the referendum projects and looking at what we're gonna do with any leftover money. Um, and once we wrap up Fund 43, we'll just remove it from the report. If there's not questions on that, then I'd like to talk a little bit about the health claims. And so I'd like to direct your attention to, there's so many documents um, shared. The, let's see, there's a document called the Health Claims History. Um, it's a PDF and it's just a short graph. And what I was trying to show with this, you know, we've been talking about claims being behind and we ended up building this surplus and now the claims are starting to, um, ramp up again. And so I just wanted to put that in perspective. So what this particular document, document shows is that the blue is the first three months of the claims of every fiscal year for the last five years, including this year then, so for six years total. And the blue line says this is how much we've paid for July, August, and September. The red line is what we start our balance out at, at the beginning of every year. It's also in most years known as our IBNR, the incurred but not reported. It's the claims that we've incurred before June 30th, but they haven't been paid for yet. And you know that's an estimate. The IBNR is is an estimate, um, and as you can see, the. In a typical year, it seems to be about 40 to 45 percent of our claims actually um, are paid in those first three months. They could that IBNR those claims still could be coming in later and paid in later months. But this is the trend. And even looking at the, we have two more years of our claim service. They fall right in that same category. The, the very first two years. Um, then we hit the one year where we had um, some extreme high cost claims, and that's the big blue line in the middle where the IBNR dipped because we just had, um, this year we had to dip into our balance. Now on the bottom of that document, I put a note that um, this is different than, we also talk about our fund balance for claims. So this balance is what I would equate to being our, our family checking account, right? You're putting your salary in, you're taking your expenses out on a day-to-day -day basis. The fund balance is more like, that's your rainy day money, right? It's your emergency fund. So if something happens in your day-to-day, -day, you've got that money to tap into, but they are two distinctly different pools of money. Um, we don't touch the other money until we have a year like it was actually the year before that was so bad um, it just tri tri uh, trickled over into um, the 18-19 school year but it was the 17-18 where the claims just kept going up and up and up because of our high cost claims then we went back down in 1920 to a more normal year but again for the first three months but then we had 2021 COVID hits in 20 and we start to show the big drop in claims. And now you can see it's starting to tip back up again. It's higher than it is in a typical year, um, not quite as high as it was in our really bad year. So that's a good sign that it's not as high as that, but um, we can just see where those claims are starting to creep up. But you can see where the red line is now. So there's, it's not a situation to be worried about, I just wanted to paint that picture with the health claims and what we're seeing. Any questions on that? It's a great slide. Yeah, it is. Oh, good. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, so we don't have to look at the actual claims payable because, I mean, we can. We're still at a significant balance right now. At the end of September, we still have 3.9 million in that particular. Um, pool of money, we started out with 5.2 million. So it's still in um, good shape for the rest of the year. We don't expect that there's gonna be any issues, but we can never predict what's gonna happen with high cost claims, unfortunately. Um, dental is also in a good position. We're 
sitting at 1 million um, in our liability count, down from 1.2 million. Very typical where we're at with this time of year because people go to see the dentist over the summer and get things taken care of. So no surprises there either. Um, Unless there's any questions, that would wrap up my budget report. Any questions? One other thing to keep in mind for the health claims and the, that reserve that we were just showing, we did freeze premiums this year, and there was medical inflation going on. It, we just also are trying to balance out. You know, we don't want to keep saving reserves because that's, at some point that's not how you're supposed to manage the program, but we are sharing that with staff and, and certainly helping. Um, balancing our budget this year. Great. Thank you much for that report. Uh, the next item in our discussion information items is the 2021-2022 budget development update. Okay. Well, we're getting there. We're getting more and more pieces. You know, this time of year, it's always... Um, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? And so I outlined what, the things that we know, the things that have been finalized, our equalized evaluation of our property increased by 6.86%, which is pretty significant for a value of $11.7 million. That's final. That's an actual number. Um, definitely a significant increase. Our, and where that helps is it helps the mill rate because right. it spreads the right. tax levy out over more property value. Computer aid will hold at the 2021 value of uh, 482,000. Uh, and that actually was a, a legislative, legislative change a couple years back where they pretty much froze it. They, they gave us like two years with the small incremental upticks and then it's been frozen since. And it would take a legislative change to change that number moving forward. The personal property aid, um, I apologize, I put in here that it would hold at 613,000. We actually had 623,000 last year, so we dropped 10,000 this year. Um, the energy efficiency exemption is gone, so all the debt was paid off. There's no energy um, efficiency exemption. The refunded rescinded taxes, that has come in at $13,391. That's um, um, an exemption that we get to get that money back when we have to pay back the taxes. Uh, final enrollment number from the third Friday count to calculate the ADM for base membership, that's in. And the average ADM to use to calculate the revenue limit is coming in at 11,720 compared to 12,013 last year. Now that's the three year average. So that's looking at the course of the three years. So it is dropping, unfortunately. Sorry, does that include e achieve? Uh, yes, but the well, it it doesn't it doesn't because the open enrollment is pulled out of this number because that is funded from a different source. So open enrollment is funded at the end of the year with payments from the districts that the students came from. So any district e achieve students would be counted in here, but non district open enrolled students would not. And um, so that's down by 293 FTEs, which is disappointing. Um, our transfer of service, uh, which is an, um, at the end of the year, if we have to, um, we, we may make agreements to pay other districts for services, and this is just, and we get an exemption for that, for anything that we paid, and that's our exemption this year. Um, the pieces that we're still waiting for, school choice pupil adjustment, that's the voucher program. Right now the budget has a five, um, anticipated a 5% increase, but again, that's the one where it's an in and an out. What we get in our exemption is the exact same thing as the cost of what we spend out in that program. Um, our general state aid from DPI, we're waiting for our final certification, which should be this week and the end of the week. And... Um, uh, so we'll expect to have all the pieces in place, um, hopefully by the 15th. Um, I'm not sure about the voucher. I just don't remember the timing of it. But our final budget book will be ready for our October 26th budget and levy approval meeting. Uh, some other items of note uh, include that the final budget does include a deficit of the 972000 due to the carryover. But that was in the preliminary budget also. The preliminary budget still does not include ESSER funding. 
We did uh, spend every penny of ESSER 1 from our, we have a little bit left in pub, private school funding, but we have uh, spent all the ESSER 1, but ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 requires some more strategic um, planning on how we're going to spend that. So it hasn't been added to the budget at the time we had developed our strategic planning. We will go ahead and bring forth a budget amendment to add that back into the budget. Um, it also does not include the FEMA and the unemployment compensation because here we are months later still saying we don't know when we're going to get that money. So um, we still uh, hope and anticipate it's coming, but no concrete information is in on the date of when that money will be received. Again, we can come forth with a budget amendment when we do get that money. Um, the So I would like to have you pull up. The document called Tax Scenario um, Tax Scenarios Waukesha FNF Meeting. That just we have three scenarios we're showing, and this isn't so we can get approval on anything. This is more of these are three different scenarios that we could look at. So scenario A shows our July first aid estimate with no debt defeasance. So over the past couple of years, we've been able to do um, some nice prepayment of debt and bring our Fund 39, which is our referendum debt, down um, by a very uh, nice amount, a significant amount. And so the scenario A just says, we're going to just pay our normal debt payment. We're not gonna defease. And that brings our levy down. The, um, across the top for all the scenarios, the um, our um, revenue amount that we can collect stays the same. So all of that, our exemptions, everything stays the same across the top, and our revenue limit remains the same across the top. It's down in the bottom half where we're looking at the differences. And so our normal debt payment is uh, $6.4 million. Um, this has a levy rate of 7.04 compared to 8.03 last year. It gives us the opportunity to bring some defeasance in if we'd like to maintain closer to where we've been spending. So scenario B says, well, here's our aid estimate again from July, but we're gonna add in the defeasance that we put in the preliminary budget because we did um, have a nice, we were able to have that in the preliminary budget. That still brings us to a 7.63 um, uh, mill rate, which is uh, still under last year's. And then scenario C says, well, let's anticipate we get a 3% increase in state aid and we have that same defeasance amount. And that puts us at 7.5. So the conversation we need to have before the final budget is how much do we want to defease? And what, um, what are you looking for us to move forward with in a final budget? Is it to maintain our mill rate the same as last year at the 8.03 and that we would defease? We also need to work with our financial um, counselors too to uh, get their opinion, but we'd really like to hear from the board where your thoughts and directions are on that. So remind me if we were to uh, continue with, let's say, scenario B, remind me where we would be at in terms of uh, when we would be projected to completely pay off that debt? I don't have the full amount. I don't have those sheets with me. I apologize. We can provide that. This would enable us, because this would be about a $7 million defeasance. It would enable us to pay off the bank loan completely, which is the $5 million one that we refinanced with Waukesha State Bank. And we have one year to prepay that. If we don't prepay that this year, then it sticks to the schedule. But we can save interest if we prepay it. Um, That's in scenario B? E e yes, scenario B and C would both allow that. Okay. And that would still allow um, almost $2 million that we would then put aside for future payments because the, the bond uh, loan isn't callable yet. We're not able to prepay that one yet. And I don't, I don't know, Darren, I'm sorry. Do you happen to have that? I didn't think to bring that. But yeah. that, we have the, the sheets that show when that is callable and when we could start applying to the, that. The bonded debt is not callable. Okay. Okay. 
the bond of debt isn't um, callable yet, but we can start setting aside dollars to make those future payments. So we do have that latitude of, of levying um, early, kind of doing the same thing, just the payout isn't the same cycle where we've been doing, you collect it, you pay it out all in the same year. Um, this will be our third, I'm just trying to bring up the budget booklet um, off the website here, our third year of defeasing. And even if we come in at the $11 million that we had last year um, for a fund 39 levy, we're still on pace to pay off the debt in six years. Um, so somewhere in that range, <clears throat> what really is going to drive this in my mind is where's that aid number coming on Friday? Bless you. So six years would be 2024? 2025. I think our last levy would be the fall of 24. No. Yes. The fall of 24. And the payments would be made the following year. So we're, we're, you know, we're having $60 million of debt. We're on a pretty uh, accelerated pace. I was going to try to pull up documents from Michelle, but I don't. So explain to me the difference between scenario B and C again. Um, C just anticipates a 3% growth in our equalization aid. So the July estimate is based off of um, our budget figure. So when DPI comes out with our July aid estimate, it's based on what we budgeted for last year. And then um, the final is based on our actuals. And so they're just going through our actuals now because our annual report was filed last week, and or actually the 17th. And so now they have all the annual reports. They're working on all the the data for all the schools and then coming out with here's your aid S, your final aid based on your actual figures versus your um, your budgeted figures and we're in you know it's a it's a guessing game right now we're looking at potentially a three percent increase and what it doesn't impact our um, our overall uh, revenue limit our revenue limit stays the same basically what it does is it um, moves the money out of the tax area and into the aid area, and so it makes your levy go down. I, th I think really what we need to know is do we want to continue defeasing right. at the, the pace we're going? Okay. Um, if we don't, because it's obviously a huge swing levy-wise, um, and you're trading that off for interest savings and paying down the debt quicker. So it's kind of mm -hmm. we have the same conversation every year. <clears throat> it won't be any of these numbers exactly because we're we're projecting here, but. Um, just get the um, okay that you'd like to see the defeasance continued. It would help us formulate um, a number to come back to you. And and we offer this every year, but, you know, if we feel the need, we need to have a, a special FNF meeting prior to approval. Um, we can send out, well, here's what we're looking at. Um, obviously, you can't vote on it, but if there's any questions. Um, otherwise, it's cer certainly not... Um, out of the question to have a special meeting because you're talking millions of dollars if we feel the need. We haven't the last couple of years, but um, we're more than willing to do that. So 2025 would be the if we stayed at the pace we were staying at to, to fees, that would be the last time we would levy. Fall but of 24 for the 24-25 school year would be the last time we would levy if we stay at this pace. Okay. Pretty right, remarkable, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, but we've I always talked. I don't know if anyone has been aggr as aggressive <clears throat> as our district has been. I don't think so. Um, and we've we've talked since we started this process of this is an annual decision. What's going on in our community and all those things. So, um, but I, I think people will like the results if we can. I mean, it's balancing, right? You're going to pay at some point in time. Right. Our taxpayers will pay at some point in time. But we have been able to um, actually have real dollar savings to our constituents. Do you want to explain to them how, 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 that, how we arrive at that and roughly what that has been <clears throat> with the pace we're, we're at? Yeah, we've, uh, what you save is on the interest expense, and that's a true tax that we never have to levy, an expense we would never um, incur because we can't 
use that savings in tax and use it for other purposes. It, it, it's not allowed. Um, so it, it saves the taxpayers in the long run. Um, the financing plan for the referendum was sold on a rate per year, tax rate per year. Um, and we've exceeded that this for these first three years, but when you consider... Exceeded in a good manner or in a bad manner? No, we went over what we said, but when we, we talked about the referendum, we talked about an average tax rate. So when you factor in that in year seven, eight, nine, and 10, the tax rate will be zero, will actually come in way below um, what the referendum promised. Um, so that's, again, it's just like paying off your, your home mortgage. Is it worth paying Sooner it off faster later. or sure. later? You know, mm -hmm. and it, it depends on your annual cash flow. It depends on a lot of factors going on in your household, but it's the exact same conversation. I've, I've been comfortable doing it. Um, I think, I think this has been a positive thing for our constituents. Um, I, I, I'm comfortable with keeping, keeping this at this pace for the defeasance. How does this play into our long-term game though? Um, that we're still putting together. So, and we analyze each of those things each year too. So, but I'm I'm comfortable with you know keeping up this pace. Yeah, I don't <clears throat> I don't think that uh, we should not defeat if we can. I mean, the savings will be great, um, and the return on the investment will definitely outweigh. For sure, we have the one time opportunity this year. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, right. One for portion. the for the bank loan. Correct. Yep. And it was set, we set it up specifically that way mm -hmm. so we could defease that portion. So I don't really have a problem moving forward with the defeasance. Does anyone think we need to have a special meeting on this? And we've been pretty much charged with, with, right. with this decision nope. all along. I, I haven't gotten a lot of phone calls, but I, I get a fair amount of, um, in December, I get a fair amount of calls from taxpayers. And the few people who I have talked to, and it's probably 10 to 12 over the years, when I explain the strategy to them, every one of them has gotten it. You know, because you can equate it to yourself and your home and your mortgage, and it's the exact same, as I said before, the exact same conversation. So if that helps um, the committee at all, um, that's been my experience with it. So just a reminder of years, I mean, most districts will take 20 years to pay off this kind of debt. We committed to 10 is what we um, essentially had told everyone prior to going to referendum. And it looks like we can come in at six with, again, some real cost savings to our constituents. Correct. What do you think, Ms. Ranchak? There you go. All right. <clears throat> well, we look forward to bringing actual final numbers in the fourth month of our fiscal year to you. <laughs> <laughs> when I first got on the Much board, I thought, I, I thought that was the craziest thing that I ever heard. <laughs> Started to write our legislators to try and get that changed. That's not changing. No, that one's not changing. <laughs> I just wanted to point out in board docs, there is a revenue limit um, worksheet that goes along with each one of these scenarios should you be inclined to want to read something before bed tonight. <laughs> They're uh, a little complicated and I'm always happy to explain if people have questions you can give me a call we can walk through them but uh, the highlights from the revenue limit worksheets are on this page they drive everything on this page so. What do you think the probability is that we're going to get a three percent increase? I want to say good because I went in and I um, put in our actuals and the, the numbers and how they flushed out, and it came in right around that range. Okay. And then we have some thought from Baird that there was another um, 
component that was changing that made it even higher, but we're both reluctant to believe that that oh, yeah. in that height. So I think 3% is a reasonable okay. thing to attain, but okay. we it's honestly just a, a, a tricky calculation, and it seems like it should be straightforward, but it never is. I, I was with Sherry, but I'm not as optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Either am I. I hope she's right, for the record. But right. uh, <laughs> like she said, when you look at last year with being COVID, you don't know what other districts spent. You yeah. don't know. There's no, so many sure. things moving around that, yep. that this makes it really hard to predict. All right. That concludes our discussion information items, unless there's any other questions regarding any of those. All right. Our last uh, item is other business recommendations for future committee meetings. Does anybody have anything that they want to... If anything pops up, um, email myself or Darren or both of us, and we will get it on the agenda. Excellent. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.